I, uh, I wrote down some uh, statements here that I actually mentioned yesterday, but I think it was perhaps confusing uh, because uh, when I first wrote down in detail what happened in the hypersurface case, uh, there were more specifics. For instance, uh, M was simply connected and is a bouquet of spheres. And then in the general case, I said some things are similar and some are not. So anyway, I summarized and put it all uh, over here. Um, so there's a kind of some general differential topology complex analysis results here. It's Milner fiber, it's compact, it's oriented, it's Stein, so it's symplectic. Uh, I haven't focused too much on the canonical contact structure on the link of a singularity, but there is one, and once you understand that, the symplectic structure on M is compatible with this contact structure. Uh, this statement here has simply to do with the fact that M is a compact oriented uh, four manifold whose boundary is a compact three manifold. Uh, so uh, you have this form of where you replace M by the resolution or any other four manifold that has sigma as the boundary. And I just, uh, the rank, uh, the rank is a mu and since it has a bilinear form I write down the Sylvester invariance. M, M is the Milner fiber. M is the Milner fiber. Um, but then there are some theorems that are special to this case. I mentioned the theorem of uh, Groyle and Steinbring that the first Betty number of M is zero even though the fundamental group can be infinite. Um, uh, there's, th uh, there's this result which is not so difficult in the hypersurface case but you need a lot of uh, uh, fancy work uh, to do the general case. And uh, then finally I mentioned this formula in the hypersurface case it's uh, much harder to prove uh, in the general case, but it's not true in general. But it is true if he is Gorenstein. So you'll notice that this formula does not involve the particular smoothing. And we already mentioned uh, last time uh, that uh, for some very simple examples, you can have two different Milner numbers for two different smoothings of the same singularity. But in the Gorenstein case, that doesn't uh, happen. Uh, and finally, I mentioned that if you, when we talk about the existence of smoothings, many singularities don't smooth, but all rational singularities smooth. And the way to remember that is you go to the, the resolution, and now that's a smooth surface, and you deform so that all exceptional cycles go away, and you're allowed to blow down, and that gives you a smoothing of V, and the Milner fiber is diffeomorphic to the resolution. Okay, so I'm just recalling this from, um, from yesterday. Now the last thing we uh, did yesterday was something about a, a rational homology disk uh, smoothings, but I want to start by talking about the miniversal deformation of V, also known as the uh, semi-universal deformation. So, uh, so this is a general uh, a theorem. There exists uh, some uh, deformation V0, S0, deformation of V. Well, I'll, let me say the semi-universal deformation. Semi-universal deformation of uh, the germ V0. Something called a semi-universal deformation of V0. So that means, of course, this is a flat morphism and you have an identification of the special fiber with V0. Uh, such a thing exists um, and what is the property of a semi-universal deformation? Every deformation is obtained from this by base change. Such that every deformation of uh, V0 comes, uh, uh, comes fr is from this via a base change. So in other words, if you had some um, um, V prime zero into T zero, there exi would exist a map of T zero into S zero uh, such that uh, V prime zero is the pullback deformation. Um, 
but uh, that's just. But uh, we also want it to be minimal in some sense, uh, so this should be a minimal, meaning that this uh, basically that this tangent map is unique. So uh, you don't have a universal deformation, but there's some minimality condition. And uh, how? So what can we say about S? Well, S is in general just an arbitrary scheme. S is in a fairly ar an arbitrary scheme almost. So it has uh, many components. Um, embedded points. So in the lecture uh, this afternoon, I'll talk about this for a uh, hypersurface singularity, where in fact this is a kind of very simple, and you can write it down, and S is a smooth space. So for uh, V and ICIS, that implies S is smooth. But in general, you'll have uh, lots of things. Um, and so, uh, just remember the, uh, the, this example originally to Pinkham, this uh, cyclic quotient singularity. So the uh, base space looks like the uh, base space of the semi-universal deformation looks like this. So here's S. This is, uh, has dimension three. And uh, the deformations in this component in S correspond to these uh, deforming the resolution. So this is from uh, deformation of the resolution. And then this one-dimensional component. That's the uh, QHD smoothing that I mentioned last time. So in general, when you, when you look at the semi-universal deformation of an isolated singularity, you get some versal family. The base space uh, parameterizes uh, every deformation. Uh, here is a non-trivial example where you, it consists of two components. So. Um, it's natural to, uh, but the minimality condition means uh, that you know something about the tangent space of S. I'll just say that the dimension of the tangent space of S at zero, this is uh, something called a T1 in the literature, but in fact it's, uh, uh, it's the length of some X group, X1 R, omega 1 R, R, where R is the local ring. So there's some X group, the length of which is telling you the tangents, dimension of the tangent space of S. But of course you can see in this picture what you really care about are the dimensions of these components. So uh, first of all I, I want to introduce a term of a smoothing component, so definition. A smoothing component Um, of S is an irreducible component S prime oh, uh, so that the fiber over a general point is non-singular such that the fiber um, let me call this map capital F such that the fiber F inverse of T is non-singular for T in uh, S prime, a generic. <coughs> so in this case, uh, smoothing occurs in, in both components, so those are, smoothing com those are called uh, smoothing components. Um, okay, so uh, we'll be talking uh, later today a bunch about how you would try and figure out the dimension of the smoothing component. And on any smoothing component, there's a Milner fiber. Uh, there exists uh, a Milner fiber for each um, smoothing component. Okay, so we, w we want that uh, kind of background before we uh, go back and look at these uh, 
at the QHD smoothing. So let's do that. Now they were introduced uh, at the end of the lecture uh, yesterday. So let's remember uh, how we did those. So we started with 0 less than r less than p, p and r relatively prime. And uh, we, uh, we have the following theorem. Uh, so a cyclic quotient singularity has a um, rational homology disk smoothing. Right, that means a smoothing where the Milner number is zero. Um, if and only if n q is equal to p squared p r minus one. So last time um, we constructed one in this case. So last time, remember, we constructed. So this implies that the uh, converse isn't isn't very hard once the general theory is set up. So I'll just say uh, this is uh, not hard. W w once you once you kind of have the basic formulas, uh, which I've hinted to uh, up here. Um, Okay, so what's so uh, what's so great about that? Uh, for, first of all, what do these look like? What do the graphs look like? They're cyclic quotient singularities. So, the first case is p equal two r equal one four comma one. That's this uh, this old Pinkham example. So the so the examples are the first one uh, looks like this. Uh, second one is a uh, minus 5 and a minus 2. And then the way you go ahead is on one side you stick a minus 2 and on the other side you um, on the other side you uh, make it more negative. So over here we could put a, a, a minus 2 over here uh, stick and then make this side more negative and you get a minus 3. Yeah, or you could have gone a minus 6 minus 2, minus 2. And it's an easy combinatorial way to see this is how you produce uh, all of them, just so that you get a picture of what these, uh, what these guys look like. So uh, let me just recall how we made these QHD smoothings. It's actually uh, the uh, construction which is uh, particularly interesting. Um, this was uh, this is a quotient uh, of a smoothing of the uh, AP minus one singularity. Okay, the, which x z minus y to the p equals zero. So uh, uh, this singularity is a cyclic quotient of this by z mod p and the smoothing you make by smoothing this equivariantly and carrying along the z mod p. Um, you, you, uh, you smooth um, a p minus 1 uh, equivariantly. But p is not the no, 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 no. p is just a number. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's a problem. I use N and Q here and P and R there. Oh, what else shall I use? M? Okay. <laughs> Equivariantly, uh, with, with respect to the action of the, with respect to the cyclic group. So, uh, so what this means is the following. Cyclic group of order P. Of order P. Cyclic group of order P. Okay. So remember what the uh, picture was. I had um, C3 into C, which was given by Xz minus Y to the P. But I had a group that I, the cyclic group, G sub P, the, that I wrote down. And when we looked at this picture, uh, this was G invariant. So I had this picture and uh, I view this as giving you uh, smoothings of the special fiber. That's an AP minus 1 and smoothings of this, of the quotient of the special fiber by a z mod p, which is, you figure out is, uh, is that guy up there. Um, so the fact that it's a, uh, a quotient of a smoothing of this is particularly important. Uh, this is 
an example of what we'll call a Q-Gorenstein smoothing. So let me say a few words about that. Um, some of you know already know about this well. Um, remember, cyclic quotient singularities are rational, and rational singularities aren't Gorenstein, unless they're rational double points. However, all rational singularities are Q Gorenstein. In fact, all rational singularities, including any uh, VNQ, are what Miles called Q Gorenstein. That means cyclic quotients or arbitrary quotients of a Gorenstein singularity. Cyclic quotients of a Gorenstein singularity. And in fact, um, what happens is, remember, the Gorenstein singularity has a um, nowhere zero holomorphic two form, so the dualizing sheaf is free. So remember, so any v, any uh, v comma zero has uh, what we might call the dualizing sheaf, or a dualizing module, or case of v. That's the global sections of v of, uh, v of the two forms, and this is a reflexive rank one sheaf, but this is free if and only if it's Gorenstein. Free if and only if it's Gorenstein. Q Gorenstein means that it's torsion. Q Gorenstein, that's equivalent to uh, omega v uh, tensor n well, I'd better be careful here. Omega v bracket n, which means the you tensor it with itself n times, and then you take the double dual. The, you know when you tensor modules that aren't free, you pick up all sorts of uh, it's non-reduced. You get terrible things. You have to double dualize them in order to uh, get to the geometry. So that's this is the same as gamma of v minus zero, omega two of v tensored with n, n times, if and only if this is free for some n. Okay, so omega two of v off the singular point is, uh, that's an invertible sheaf, and we're just saying that uh, that, that has, uh, is it when you raise that to the nth power, take global sections, that's uh, free. So this is what Q Gorenstein means, and as a result, in the Q Gorenstein case, um, you take the smallest n, for which this is trivial, and you can make a cyclic cover. It's the usual story if you have a line bundle of order n, then you can make an n-fold cyclic cover. It's a standard way to do that. So in this case, we have the line bundle uh, on v minus zero, you can take an n-fold cyclic cover and then take the normalization, close it up, and that would be Gorenstein. So you, uh, you can construct uh, an n-fold uh, cyclic cover, which is Gorenstein. So this is uh, usually called the index one cover. This is called the cover. Although, uh, actually, before Miles came up with that name, I called it the canonical cover, but that name didn't catch on. <laughs> Index one cover uh, caught on. Okay, so, uh, so that's what a Q Gorenstein singularity is. All rational singularities are Q Gorenstein, and that's because when you do the basic theory of a uh, rational singularity is you find that every line bundle on the punctured spectrum is torsion. In fact, the whole Picard group is finite. 
So it's a general fact about rational singularities. If you have any line bundle, the puncture neighborhood, it's torsion. In particular, the canonical uh, bundle. And so this was uh, is a very old um, observation. Um, so in any case, uh, rational singularities, quotient singularities, all these are uh, Kugorenstein. And uh, what happens in a Kugorenstein smoothing is you go up to the canonical cover and try and smooth that carrying along the cyclic group action. And if you can do that, it's called uh, Kugorenstein smoothing. In fact, I think the name Kugorenstein smoothing uh, is due to uh, Kalar and Shepard Barron, but they're basically using these, uh, observing that the Kugorenstein, uh, the fact that you did things this way was important. So uh, let me just say um, uh, one remark about why you should focus on these. Why focus on these? So the first thing uh, I should mention is that these are minimal in the following sense. The smoothing components, see these are smoothing, so they correspond to some smoothing components, are one-dimensional. Smoothing components are one-dimensional in these cases. So that means, remember when you take the semi-universal deformation and start deforming, you find nearby singularities. Okay, so all the nearby singularities are found by moving, moving around the nest. But if you have a component that's one-dimensional, there's only smoothing nearby in that direction. So that's kind of a minimality statement. Pardon me? It's also important the smoothing component is unique. Yes, so the way you get a smoothing, remember I said this guy has a, a universal mapping property. So if you have a one parameter family over a disk, that means there's a map of the disk into, into here whose special fiber is smooth. That means you're on a smoothing component. I don't understand. In the, in the case of a minus four curve, you say it's three-dimensional, this smoothing component. Yes, but that's not a QHD smoothing component. I, I should have said QHD. For these special components, these special QHD components are always one-dimensional. So, I mean, you calculated it over here, but it's always true. So, okay, so the, uh, now, Originally, uh, in my 1980 paper, I used these to, uh, I used to construct um, interesting deformations. Um, deformations and smoothings of other singularities. So let me give you an example of how I could take a singularity not of this type and make an interesting smoothing. Okay? Uh, so here's an example. Suppose I take the uh, V sub 19 comma 7. Some cyclic quotient singularity. It's not of that type. And the, the graph uh, looks like this. Uh, minus 3, minus 4, minus 2. So on the minimal resolution, that's what you see. Now if you deform and make them all go away, you'll be, you'll have something of Milner number uh, three. Okay, so the, uh, the um, deform V twiddle, you get um, a smoothing where the Milner number is uh, three. Right, because this is diffeomorphic to the real resolution. But now, instead of looking at this resolution of the singularity and smoothing, suppose we collapse this minus four curve to a point. So let me switch from the, uh, I, I should have drawn this with the curves. Uh, yeah, let me do it this way. Minus three, minus four, minus two. So let's collapse the minus four curve to a point and um, we'll get some 
singular space with one singularity, this minus four singularity, and then we'll have these two curves going through there. Call this guy V prime. So this is a partial resolution. Partial resolution. Now, this singularity has an interesting smoothing. That's the minus four singularity. That's one of these. So what you can do, the, all the obstruction theory vanishes you know, for a smooth, uh, for this, is for, for this uh, the surface, the, the global H2s vanish. So what you can do is smooth this guy, make this singularity go away, but in the interesting way. So smooth uh, in an interesting way. In other words, achieve the local deformation of that singularity that's interesting by a global deformation of V prime and then blow down. Then blow down. And you get a different smoothing that's uh, with different Milner number. Get, you get a different uh, Milner number, different mu, a two, I think. So, not just for cyclic quotient singularities, but for other singularities. So, uh, doing this, uh, one could con easily construct. You're taking a real smooth thing. Pardon me? You're taking this one dimensional smooth thing. Yes, what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to deform V prime, but locally I'm going to make a, uh, I'm going to paste together deformations, but the local deformation I make around here is the interesting smoothing. Yes, but why do the minus one and minus two curve remain? No, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I can make the... Watch how you blow down. Well, I didn't, I, I'm going to deform V prime to a script V prime. Right, and what you blow down afterwards? Uh, I, I'm going to take global sections of that. So, so basically this uh, map here is uh, taking global sections. It's pi lower star of the structure sheaf. I, I didn't want to get into the... Uh, the, the it doesn't have any compact curves in it. So you're yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that go away. So when, when I blow it down, it's... It, it's uh, I'm, I'm going to make all the... All the, all the compact fibers, all the cycles go away. I mean, it's very much similar to what I described um, uh, over, over here, except that if I made the local smoothing of this in the stupid way, I would just be uh, deforming up there. So um, in this way, it's easy to make examples with as many smoothing components as you like. Easy to construct examples with um, large large number of smoothing components. So, I mean, at the time, this, uh, I mean, this was something new. I mean, it's a, you know, when Pinkham did this example, it was a kind of first easy example of a singularity whose deformation space was obstructed, that wasn't smooth. So, uh, at the time, when this was generalized, it, it was always to examples kind of like this that had just two components. Uh, but uh, using, uh, using this methodology of partial resolutions, you could get, uh, get as many as you, uh, as you wanted. And actually, the whole search for these was motivated by some obscure uh, paper by Brieskorn in which he was talking about hypersurface singularities and how can you define, deform a hypersurface singularity and get, a, get another one. It, it's not so clear that it should deform except he writes it down. And uh, it was an attempt to understand those that one found uh, these kinds of uh, smoothings and you could explain those interesting ones he found sort of by this, uh, by the system of looking at partial resolutions and making interesting deformations of these singularities on partial resolutions. So the, the next uh, thing I should mention, the next application three, this is uh, Kalara Shepard Barron and their Invenciones paper in uh, 1988. This is the paper uh, that Radu uh, referred to for other reasons. So they took this theme 
uh, and applied it to uh, cyclic quotient singularities, and uh, they formulated formulated a conjecture to describe all smoothings of VNQ of all cyclic quotients. And basically what they would do is uh, take the actual resolution, the minimal resolution, and not only uh, blow down um, these guys when you saw them in the configuration, but maybe blow up first. Maybe blow up first and then blow down. So they gave a, they gave a, a particular sequence of steps you could take that at the end involved collapsing these, conver- these uh, configurations to singular points with known QHD uh, smoothings and then uh, deforming and blowing down by, ach- by uh, achieving the interesting deformations of those points. So, uh, uh, so this was his uh, formulation. You can, o- you can always blow down. But you does not have one of the things, then you can blow up to get it. That, that's right. So he, de- he described a specific, uh, they described a specific way to do that, and then conjectured that this is, uh, this is all of them. You, uh, you had to, um, um, so uh, I'll just say this generated lots of activity. <laughs> Because this, uh, I mean, there was some Mori theory in this. There were, there were a lot of finite generation of certain uh, graded rings. And eventually, the, uh, the theorem was proved. A lot of people uh, contributed. I, I won't uh, list them all. I'll, I'll mention Jan Stevens and Christofferson, Popescu Pampu, uh, Liska. So. So the theorem was basically that this conjecture was proved. So first of all, um, for um, VNQ, uh, there exists a one-to-one correspondence between um, what they called P resolutions. So P resolutions had to do with blowing up and blowing down and getting certain intermediate partial resolutions and smoothing components. So this was, this was their conjecture. And uh, you could have quite, quite a lot of them. I mean, it was a fairly intricate uh, routine. Uh, I should, should mention maybe for a rational singularity, every component is a smoothing component. So. When you deform a rational singularity, you always get a rational singularity. So you only have smoothing components. So it's kind of all the components in the semi-universal deformation. So uh, there was this. And uh, also, uh, there exists a one-to-one correspondence between um, smoothing components and, so, th- so this is interesting, QHD uh, oh, sorry, I don't mean QHD. And symplectic fillings. <laughs> of the uh, lens space, L of NQ. Compatible with a contact structure. up to blow up. So this is uh, really the work of uh, Liska. So I pointed out that every Milner fiber uh, gives you a symplectic filling. And uh, of course if you have a symplectic filling you could blow up a point and that's still symplectic filling. But modulo that you can just say hey let's ask a weaker question than um, finding Milner fibers and from smoothing components, let's just ask about symplectic fillings. And the, uh, it turns out every sy- the only symplectic fillings come from this construction. Um, although I want to point out when you say um, 
these correspond one to one, the count uh, has to be done very carefully. Very carefully. Remember, a deformation comes equipped with an isomorphism, a fixed isomorphism of the special fiber with the standard model. So if you do a different isomorphism, maybe you have a different smoothing component. So I'll, I'll just say a warning, the count is difficult. I mean, you can certainly distinguish two, two things with different Milner fibers, but uh, two different Milner numbers, but the, the, the count is uh, subtle. So the, uh, the fourth, uh, uh, oh, the, yeah, the fourth thing to mention was uh, KSB again, and this has to do with um, uh, Q-Gorenstein deformations. Same paper, Q-Gorenstein uh, deformations um, allow uh, consideration of not just the canonical uh, sheaf in the family, but you, but uh, multiples of that so it allows one to have um, i times the canonical sheaf varying uh, nicely in the family. So remember, in order to take um, some multiple of the canonical sheaf for a singular variety, you have to take the double dual. And in general, if you start deforming, you just mess that up. You don't have a flat family of sheaves. But in the Q Gorenstein case, if you have a Q Gorenstein smoothing, then uh, that's not a problem. So this was important um, in their work. So that's the Q Gorenstein ness being a particularly important. And the, and the fifth example is uh, Fintischel Stern. Fintischel Stern. Uh, with what they called rational blowdown. So this was uh, JDG uh, in uh, 97. So they were unaware of all, of all this. So, and in fact they just did uh, P squared P minus one uh, and it was later Jungle Park who, who extended. And they had the following symplectic question. Suppose you have a compact symplectic manifold and you have some symplectic curve configuration. Uh, here's one. Um, minus 2, minus 5, minus 3. But, and this is symplectically. These are symplectic two spheres embedded in this uh, four manifold. And uh, you can figure out their... Yeah, I mean, you make some symplectic assumptions over here. And what they want to do is the equivalent of what you could do in algebraic geometry, which is collapse this to a singular point and then try and smooth. And try and smooth in an interesting way because that has an interesting deformation. Now, from a topological point of view, you say, hey, wait a minute, it doesn't matter whether it's symplectic or topological. You just kind of take a neighborhood boundary of this and, um, you know, that neighborhood uh, boundary, that's sigma. And instead of using V twiddle, Use M. I mean, after all, M and V twiddle have the same boundary, sigma. So you would uh, just yank this out and paste in the Milner fiber. So paste in the Milner fiber for the uh, QHD smoothing. Well, from a topological point of view, that's not not so good in differential uh, in differential geometry. So what they proved is that you could do it in such a way to extend the symplectic structure. Okay, so so this is called rational blowdown. They kind of blow this down. They'd have a symplectic singular point. So uh, what they did is they um, they could they could do uh, they could do the whole thing symplectically. And the reason this was important is you could control, you could control the cyborg witten invariance. So for that, you need to know extra things about this four manifold whose boundary is, uh, is sigma. Um, but that's given for you uh, kind of for free by all this in information, the Stein manifold, etc., that you have for a smoothing.
Um, and using this, they were able to construct some exotic differentiable structures. So this was another application in the sixth. Uh, is due to, well, John Gill Park and uh, Yang Nam Lee and later on other versions by um, by uh, Chin and uh, and uh, and the Heisang Park, and there the idea was to do this in the complex analytic category, where it's harder. So what they did is they uh, used uh, Hugh Gorenstein smoothing uh, to make a new make new uh, projective algebraic surfaces. So there what you do is the following. You carefully produce from P2 or for some familiar rational service, you blow up a bunch until you spot and you make configurations like this. Okay, so you've got this well-known surface and then you have these special curve configurations that are of this type. And then you collapse them to singular points, which you can do in the algebraic category because they're just cyclic quotient singularities. Now you have a singular surface. And now you, um, you know that you want to deform these in an interesting way to kill homology. You'll kill homology because here you have one, two, three, four cycles, but now the Miller number is going to be zero. So you're going to lose, you're going to lose a lot of homology. Um, but now with a projective surface, you can't necessarily achieve globally what you can do locally. So you have to study the obstructions. So achieve, achieve uh, the local uh, deformations globally by, by controlling the obstructions, control obstructions. So even though Fabrizio didn't mention this in his paper about uh, surfaces with a PG equals zero, this is a this is a great way to compute uh, surfaces with PG equals zero, and the Barlow surface has been found um, uh, by this kind of uh, construction. Okay, so that, that's sort of why this uh, became interesting. So uh, the question is, well, are there other examples? Are there other examples of a QHD smoothings? And the answer is yes, and in fact, when I worked on this, uh, you know, back in the uh, early 80s, I had many more examples. So, there exist uh, many more examples of uh, QHD uh, smoothings. For, not for cyclic quotients, but for other uh, singularities. So, um, a bunch were made by the quotient construction. Quotient construction uh, gave uh, many examples. So, uh, let me just remind you what you need to do to make a quotient construction from C3. So, e.g., suppose you have H contained in a GL3C acting um, freely uh, off the origin. And suppose F is, uh, has an isolated, is a polynomial with an isolated singular point and um, it's H, H invariant. Okay, then you're allowed to make this diagram, uh, so then you, uh, then you get a, um, uh, uh, then you get a Q-Gorenstein smoothing of um, F equals zero modulo H. This is the picture I did uh, two days ago. And the Milner fiber is the Milner fiber of F divided by a free action of H. So if you can find H and F, so if 
1 plus uh, the Milner number of f is equal to the order of h. So I did this a little exercise, then m is a QHD. So you want to have, uh, have some interaction between groups and polynomials. Uh, F has to have an isolated fixed point. Um, it's got to be H invariant. And, uh, but the Milner number is not too big. It's equal to this. And if you can do that, you get a QHD. And so there are many examples. So e.g., if you look at X, uh, F equals... Um, x to the py plus y to the qz plus z to the rx, which has a nice isolated singularity. So the um, Milner number here is, uh, I guess, uh, pqr. Then uh, there exists a cyclic uh, h um, of order what it should be, um, pqr plus 1 little exercise for you to figure out. Just take some, some diagonal uh, uh, matrix and uh, that, gives you, that gives you some examples. So th this is a family that was later called um, WPQR and the first one is uh, the first one in the family has a resolution diagram that looks like this. So this is the diagram, not of the hypersurface, but of the quotient. That's of uh, f equals zero mod h. So there is a way to produce uh, examples by the uh, by this quotient construction. So I had a uh, some of these were published, but others, you know, was just a secret list for the specialists. But um, in the uh, in 2005, uh, Andras Stipschitz became interesting interested in extending. Fintischel and Stern to other examples. To other examples, not just the cyclic quotients. So we uh, so we uh, wrote a paper and that paper and follow-ups uh, ended up with the following. It's a theorem. So that's uh, Stipsich, Sabo, uh, that way. What? Where, where is it? The O. Anyway, me, uh, and then uh, later Stipschitz and uh, Bhopal. And that is, there exists a complete list of graphs. There exists a complete list of graphs of star of star-shaped graphs. That means with weighted homogeneous singularities. Well, let me write it down. There exists a complete list of star-shaped gamma um, for which there exists a singularity with graph gamma with a QHD smoothing. So there's just for star-shaped graphs. So, and it turned out this was equal to my old list. But uh, in this work, uh, the way uh, uh, Stipschitz approached it kind of gave it a, a, a neater form than I had. And so uh, let me just name the, uh, the example. So the examples are the cyclics that we talked about. Um, three triply infinite families, WPQR, NPQR, um, MPQR. See that, that the cyclic quotients was a double family. This this one is a triply index family. Um, A4P, B4P, C4P. And I'll just say two exceptionals. So the, these are the only graphs. So I'll, I'll mention, for instance, that over here, the ze case zero 
is uh, the graph that looks like uh, minus 2, minus 3, minus 6, with a minus 2 in the middle. So those of you who've been uh, reading, uh, reading some of Miles' books will recognize that this and this are uh, log canonical singularities. Log canonical singularities. But there are only, only a few of these are log canonical. In any, way, in any case, these came with graphs. This one was particularly interesting because it had a, uh, it had a vertex of valency 4. Minus 3 is over here. Minus 4, minus 2. So that's a complete list. And uh, so two questions. Why do these occur? Okay. Uh, well, because uh, you could construct them. Most all of them you could construct by this quotient method. But some of them, uh, in particular these, the exceptional ones, I only knew how to construct using another method due to Henry Pinkham called smoothings of negative weight, which is... Uh, 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 very nice because uh, it gave an, a, a new global algebra geometric way to um, construct to construct these things, but had the disadvantage that you couldn't see that it was Q-Gorenstein. So all of these quotient ones are Q-Gorenstein because your your top space your your uh, your top space was always Gorenstein in, the, in, the, in these examples. So. It was a quotient of a Gorenstein smoothing. The ones you make using Pinkham's method it wasn't at all clear. Um, now, so where did this, uh, what other question was there? Well, from the analytic point of view, these guys had a node of valency 4, uh, which meant that in the resolution there was a curve intersecting four other points, and there's a cross ratio there. So you had to pin down which, which particular singularities had that property? So what are the cross ratios? So what are the cross ratios? Uh, another question was um, how many smoothings were there for a given graph? Maybe there would be two QHD smoothings for the same singularity. And in fact, uh, I already had examples of, of that. So both of those issues, the cross ratios and how many, uh, been more or less settled uh, recently by my student, uh, Jacob Fowler. So let me just uh, say, uh, how did we do this? How did we do this? And why were these guys interested? Well, because the arguments were uh, differential topological using the theorem of Donaldson on four manifolds that have a definite intersection pairing. So if a four manifold has a, a definite intersection pairing, then it's diagonal. Okay, so, so you use uh, Donaldson's uh, theorem on uh, definite, uh, on, on four manifolds with a definite intersection pairing. And a, 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 common, a, a combinatorial um, uh, approach. So uh, the question is, um, so there's a question, there's another question that in all of these cases, uncircled, I had made examples. But maybe there were other examples of QHD smoothings of these that did not come that did not come from the quotient construction. So, uh, needed another theorem, and that says that uh, the, uh, the, the above, uh, that, uh, that a, a, a QHD smoothing in the above cases is Q Gorenstein. So whether or not it came from the quotient construction or not. Um, so the reason this um, required a theorem uh, alluded to a comment Fabrizio made yesterday over on this board. 
if you smooth a rational singularity, the total space is rational. Okay? If you um, make a QHD smoothing of a rational singularity, then the uh, dualizing sheaf is torsion. So, a note. So, if V comma zero into C zero is a QHD smoothing, then uh, the local ring, uh, the three-dimensional singularity is rational. So, uh, Cohen-Macaulay. And the dualizing sheaf, uh, because of the QHD assumption, is a torsion. So it's a Q Cartier divisor. It's a Q Cartier divisor. So you can try and make the index one cover. So the quote index one cover is going to give you some, I don't know, W comma zero into V comma zero. Um, uh, you make a cyclic cover corresponding to this. And now up here, the dualizing sheaf is trivial. But it's not obvious that this is Cohen Macaulay. It's that Cohen Macaulay. So that's what you have to prove. Why? Because if this is Cohen Macaulay, if this is Cohen Macaulay, then it's Gorenstein. And so the three-dimensional total space is the quotient of a Gorenstein singularity, so you had a Q-Gorenstein smoothing. Um, but there's no general theory theorem that I know that would uh, produce that from this data, even assuming uh, that this guy is rational. So in, when I was originally dealing with these questions, I assumed the answer was no, it's not automatic that this is Cohen-Macaulay, and I posed it in terms of line bundle on a surface and uh, got Fabrizio to produce a counterexample. Um, to, an example that gave a counterexample to this. Uh, there are other examples known. You need, you need a different approach to do this. Um, and the way you do that is by proving a stronger result. So that's the... Uh, you have to prove... prove stronger results. So you prove that in these cases, in these cases, the uh, total space uh, script v comma zero into c of a QHD smoothing is. So when I say in these cases. I mean these graphs. I don't mean you run and you look at the, say, oh, the, this is, you know, I'm just looking at these where I could actually make one this way. I have to take into account Pinkham's construction, which might give different kinds of things. But the claim is this is log terminal. So log terminal, another word in Miles' uh, vocabulary. It's Miles' contribution to the language. Uh, these are special kinds of <laughs> I, I kind of like the I don't know right? do you also get to decide that <laughs> okay but, but uh, Q Gorenstein I'm allowed to use a hyphen and Q Cartier okay so log terminal singularities are uh, a class of singularities along with terminal canonical etc that are important in higher dimensional birational geometry it's a natural class of singularities they're generalizations of uh, rational double points or other kinds of quotient singularities, plus some more. And uh, uh, since they're log, log terminal, they're in particular uh, Q Gorenstein. So, in particular, hence Q Gorenstein. So, the smoothing is, uh, is Q Gorenstein. So, uh, anyway, this is sort of interesting because it's. When you define uh, these terms, canonical, log canonical, terminal, log, I mean, it's, it's a strange sort of thing because in order to have a, re a definition that's independent of the resolution, 
um, there are fewer invariants that um, uh, that come around. But what's important in this case is that all of these guys are weighted homogeneous. So here's the key. All examples are quasi-homogeneous. Um, so w- let me uh, just say before my last point that when you look at these graphs, uh, the graphs determine the analytic type. It's a result of uh, using work of Henry Laufer. And therefore there's only one singularity for a given graph, except here there's a cross-ratio issue. And therefore they must be weighted homogeneous. And if we have a smoothing, that's got to be a... You can always assume that that's a weighted homogeneous smoothing. And so, in th- so looking at weighted homogeneous singularities and deciding whether the log terminal is, uh, in- is, uh, is easier than the, than the other thing. So then the question is, what about, this is just for star-shaped graphs. Are there any other singularities admitting QHD smoothings? So are these the only V0 with a QHD smoothings. So uh, I conjectured that there were not, and if you pass to the next case where the graphs are not star-shaped but have two stars, that are allowed by the work with uh, uh, Stipschitz and Sabo, the, there's a restricted class of these that that might have QHD smoothings. I eliminated uh, most of these and then uh, recently there's a, uh, a preprint by Stipsich, uh, Park, uh, he's saying Park, Dansu Shin, that says, yes, these are the only examples. So, uh, this says that the only surface singularities admitting QHD smoothings are the, are the ones up there um, on this list. Um, and the one question that I ask is, where did, the, where did these come from? I mean, this is an unfamiliar group of surface singularities. Or maybe you should look at the total space of a smoothing. That's a three dimen- those are three-dimensional singularities. They're log terminal. Um, I haven't seen these before. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so all of them uh, depend only on the graphs, the analytic type? The, the analytic type. Uh, it, these are examples. Uh, Laufer has, uh, has described completely yeah. the graphs for which there's a unique analytic type. And so all of the w- graphs there have that property, except here it depends on the graph uh, and the cross-ratio. And that tells you what the analytic type is. So not, not all of them are taught? No, all of them are taught except these oh. that fail to be taught only for the most obvious reason. Okay, so anyway, thank you.